we were discussing the, in the broadest sense, the development, the emergence and the development of the polis. And uh, specifically, I had uh, been telling you about Hansen's theory about the development of the family farm and the individual <coughs> who worked the family farm as uh, a critical element in that story. <coughs> now, that same individual who uh, produced the economic wherewithal that would support uh, independent individuals who were not noblemen, <coughs> who could conduct their lives in an autonomous way, and who fought ultimately, fought their way onto uh, governmental bodies which allowed them to participate in the key decisions, the political decisions, and all other decisions in the state. <coughs> that third element of their character, of their place in the world, <coughs> is the one I want to turn to today. Their role as soldiers <coughs> fighting for the common cause, and that common cause now being <coughs> not <coughs> an individual goal, not a family goal, <coughs> but the goal of the entire civic community which was coming into being and I suppose would have had to have come into being in order to have this role fighting for one's polis. The style of warfare that emerges in this period, apparently for the first time, is what we call the hoplite phalanx <coughs> and each half of that uh, needs to be explained. Hoplite comes from the Greek word hoplites, and hoplites is built around the word hoplon, which is the name of a kind of a shield <coughs> that the infantrymen, and we are talking about an infantry formation here, <coughs> that the infantrymen <coughs> wore, or carried, I should say. <coughs> it was you want to get out of your head the notion of a shield that's a little thing that you can move around with one hand like that real easy. That's not what it was. It was a great round shield about three feet across. Um, and it, uh, it, would rec it had a kind of, let me step out here so that I can show you. I'll be doing a lot. You can hear me, can't you, back there? Is that all right? <coughs> um, Imagine a, a round shield of the size I've talked about, and one of the things that's important, this end of the shield, the right end from my perspective, has a grip on it. But in the middle of the shield, there's also a kind of a, a loose uh, piece of leather thong that you can put your arm through so that the shield is resting in part on that grip and on the grip that you hold at this end. You need to do that to be able to control a shield that's as big as that and as heavy as that because it is made fundamentally of a heavy wood, typically covered by leather, sometimes with uh, some bronze, a bronze sheet across the front of it as well. That it is a very heavy thing and it's very, it will weigh you down after a while. It's going to be really hard for you to maintain that grip on that thing all through the course of a whole battle. But that shield is the key, this hoplon, which gives the name to the uh, word hoplite, or uh, hoplites, which is hoplite. Phalanx means that these men, each man carrying his hoplon, are lined up, first of all, in a line, but that line is reproduced going back so that you end up with a, about, well, typically, a typical phalanx would have been eight men deep, eight rows deep, and that block of soldiers, however long it is, or is made up, is called the phalanx, which is something like, it means something originally, something like a roller. It's because the, the uh, phalanx would have looked, if you were up on a hill somewhere watching it go by, as though something was rolling across the plain as the men went forward. And, um, looking pretty formidable as that anything in its way would be mowed down in the normal course of events. So that's the, what we mean by the hoplite phalanx, a corps of heavily armed infantrymen in a solid block. Okay, 
when did this come into effect? Remember, I'm going to start out today's talk by giving you what is, has been the standard orthodox interpretation of how the hoplite phalanx worked, <coughs> uh, of which I think, uh, again, Hansen has uh, given us the clearest and most useful account. But as you know already from what you've read, this has come into great dispute in recent years, and I'll just say a little bit about the dispute before we get through today. <coughs> but what I'm giving you is the old-fashioned, traditional interpretation. By that view, the phalanx would have come into being somewhere between about 700 and 650 <coughs> BC, which is to say after the earliest polis are in business. Uh, and according to this interpretation, you really have them growing up together. Nobody could be exactly sure about how this process worked. One of the big arguments <coughs> that is part of this story is did this development of a new way of fighting come about rather quickly over a matter of a few years? Or did it stretch out over quite a long time? The most extreme critics of the traditional point of view would say over a century that you don't get the full-blown hoplite phalanx that I will be describing to you <coughs> even into the f until you get to the fifth century BC. But as, again, let's, let's take it in the traditional way. So if you imagine this is growing up as the polis comes into being, let me describe what a hoplite <coughs> was like and then try to describe what the phalanx was like and how they operated and what are some of the consequences of their coming into being. The hoplite himself is marked by, first of all, the shield, and second of all, if we, as we continue to think about his defensive capacities, he has a certain amount of armor to protect his body. <coughs> he has on top of his head a helmet made of bronze, perhaps weighing about five pounds. These are approximate. They would have differed from person to person to some degree. A very important element, he would have had a, a breastplate made of bronze, perhaps as much as 40 pounds worth. He would have uh, snapped across his shins greaves, sort of like the uh, shin guards that a catcher in baseball wears, also made of bronze. The shield itself, as I told you, was made of a heavy wood covered by a leather or bronze sheet about three feet across something in the neighborhood of 16 to 20 pounds worth of shield, and gripped, as I told you before. So you want to think about this hoplite as uh, when he has everything on and when the shield is in place. Again, let me sort of try to demonstrate this. He, is, he ought to be covered by some kind of defense from head to toe. The top is this uh, helmet that comes up over his uh, face and covers it pretty totally. It's um, made of strong metal. It's, uh, it's got very thin slits to be able to see straight ahead. Covered up, everything else is covered up. A good one will cover some of your neck as well. It's very hard to see very much, and you can't see anywhere pretty much but straight ahead. You shouldn't be able to hear very much either. And um, what else? Uh, I don't. Must have been. Mustn't have been too delightful to breathe out of the thing. Although your your nose is got free, but it's covered by a nose piece. So there's this guy with this helmet. It must weigh. I'm trying. To, I always wonder how the modern football helmets, which are monstrous. I'm so old. We used to play with leather ones without a face mask. Uh, what do they weigh? Get any football players here? I think they weigh a lot. <coughs> I mean, I think they're very heavy indeed, but I don't know how much they weigh. Anyway, if you imagine uh, sort of putting on a modern football helmet with that mask in front of you, you would begin to get an idea, only begin to get an idea of what it was like to have that uh, bronze helmet on your head. So there, there you are with that. Then you remember, you got shin guards down to your feet. You have this breastplate. Now, between your waist and your shin guard, there's some very delicate territory, and there's no um, 
Armor. That's what your shield is for. Your shield should cover that territory. You want that shield up so that it pretty well meets your helmet. So, so it's going to be at a certain distance. Uh, but it will also go down to where it needs to go down here. If everything goes right, your enemy won't be able to penetrate you. But you should be aware <coughs> that there are two places where you are relatively vulnerable for openers. And that is, if somebody can come in above your shield, your throat is going to be available to him. And if somebody can come in under your shield, then your vulnerable area will be vulnerable indeed. So those are places where you see people get wounded and killed, <coughs> if that can be done. One other very important thing to understand this defensive problem, and <laughs> this is one of the debatable issues uh, between the old guard and the uh, traditional interpretation. I'm still giving you the traditional view. If you imagine that your hoplite is standing with his left foot slightly extended in front of his right, and we'll see in a moment it pretty well has to be in order to deal with the spear that he's grasping, <coughs> and if he's holding his shield as he must this far, then he's got a half a shield sticking out in this direction so that he's pretty well protected on the left side, but he's got nothing protecting his right side. If somebody can come at him from this side, he is very vulnerable from there. Now that's a very important point, because why in the world would you give a shield of the kind I am describing for a man to defend himself if you imagine him standing by himself anywhere, if you imagine him any distance from the rest of the guys fighting alongside of him? It, this has been one of the major reasons for explaining the function of the phalanx as I will explain it to you. What are you going to do about the vulnerability on this side? Well, the answer is, it, uh, uh, the tr in the traditional view, is not, is that he was never meant to stand by himself. A hoplite only makes sense in a phalanx. And a phalanx understood in this way only makes sense if you imagine very close order. Basically, ideally, the, the right side of my shield is being met by the left side of the shield of the guy to my right so that we make a solid block of soldiers able to defend ourselves <laughs> imperfectly, but really essentially quite well. Obviously, some of us are going to get killed, some of us are going to go down, and we'll cope with that in just a few minutes. But if you think of us as a unit, we have a way of ma maintaining our security, our safety, so long as we remain w in the proper formation that I have been describing. Let me talk about the offensive aspect of it. The idea of going into battle is not merely to avoid being killed. The purpose is to kill the other fellow. How do you do it? The hoplite has two weapons, of which the most important by far is a, um, a pike, I guess is what we would call it. It's a spear that you don't throw. It's a, a spear that you thrust. <coughs> and it has... Um, <coughs> It's got a, a bronze point, which is the business end of the weapon. Its length might be anywhere from six to eight feet in length. Uh, I, I said uh, bronze, but actually it was the, the tip was usually iron, uh, but it could be bronze as well. In addition, it had a butt made also of bronze, which could be a lethal weapon. If I strike you in a vulnerable place with a stick that has a bronze butt on it, it could well kill you. It would happen because the uh, spear itself was made of wood. And that meant you can count on it often breaking in the midst of battle. In which case, if you have one end of it or the other, you can still have a point that you can use to help yourself in the scrum that is a hoplite phalanx battle. Um, and uh, although I don't quite understand, I should say there's many things about how the fighting went on <coughs> which we can only attempt to imagine because we just don't have uh, films of ancient 
Hoplite battles, I'm sorry to say. We have people inventing them, but uh, even the ones that are invented aren't very helpful, because it's awfully hard to know how they did what they did. But I think we can imagine some part of it e more easily than the other. What I was going to say is that you could, at least theoretically, strike with your spear in an overhand manner, or you could strike with it in an underhand manner. The only thing is I don't know how you do that underhand when you're in the middle of a phalanx. But, so I will be talking about the overhand stroke, which I find it easier to grasp. Um, so let's see if I can, again, give you some sense of what this is like. You have a, um, here's a hoplite standing like this. And when he comes into contact with the uh, opposing army, he will presumably strike down in this way. There are other things that he can do. His shield, in addition to being a defensive uh, thing, is also potentially an offensive weapon. He can belt you with that uh, uh, shield. And if he's stronger than you are, or better prepared, or more balanced than you are, he could knock your shield out of your hand. He could knock you back and open up a space. He could knock you down. And so you should imagine that there's at least one chance to give a guy a shot with the shield. And after that, you could just be using it as a, something to press the other fellow back. And you would, uh, uh, meanwhile, be whacking away with this in the most simple picture that you can have of how the hoplite would have conducted himself. The um, other weapon was a short sword that he kept at his side, which presumably he would not use so long as he had a spear, which was a better weapon. But if that broke, if that wasn't available to him, he could turn to his short sword, which was a thrusting sword, not like the Roman short sword, which was double-edged and slashing. You had to stick somebody with this uh, uh, hoplite phalanx sword. Now. That, that gives you the picture of the individual. I hope you can get some sense of um, what the phalanx might be like. But it, as I try to describe how the fighting really went, I always find it necessary to ask for some audience participation so that you can get some idea of what it might have looked li like in a very, very limited way. So I would like to ask for some volunteer hoplites. The Greeks, uh, as far as I know, did not allow anybody to be left-handed in a phalanx, think about the problem. Uh, so, but we don't care, you can be a lefty. Uh, you, um, of course the Greeks only allowed men to fight in the phalanx, but we're much more elevated than that. <laughs> so could I ask any of you who have the courage to come forward and fight in my phalanx? Nobody? Just come, come forward. I think we got more room here. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That'll do. All right. We have a couple of oh, good, good, fine. Why don't I have the, the shorter people come towards me and the ta taller people go into in the back? I think this makes it easier for us. All right, let's just line up next to each other. I guess you, you'll do up here. Come on up. There you go. Uh, now, uh, right behind him, in perfect order, you guys. The biggest guy's in the back. Go ahead. Good, good. And make it a third row. There's enough for a third row. Are we all set? Back up. Make sure you're behind somebody, directly behind somebody. We need, how many we got up front? Four? Have we got four? That's a, so we'll have a three in the back. That'll be all right. <laughs> but you get right behind that guy. You got to be, boy, you got to be lined up. All right, now, get into your hoplite stance. Left foot forward. Okay. Now, when you're fighting, if you're fortunate enough, and the Greeks were sometimes fortunate enough, to fight people who were not hoplites, like when the, the Persians came at them, they fought uh, hoplites against non-hoplites. Boy, that's a nice day for a hoplite. The, the Persian infantry did not have heavy armor. 
They did not have that kind of a shield. They had wicker shields. We have, fortunately, we have vase paintings that show us Persians. For one thing, they're not dressed like civilized people in a dress. They're wearing pants. <laughs> uh, but they're also, their shields are made of wicker and they don't have that kind of uh, metal body armor and all that stuff. And so you could blow through that infantry like butter. I'm probably never that easy, but really you're just not going to lose. And the truth of the matter is hoplites beat non-hoplites in all battles that are fought on flat land uh, in, uh, in battles that the Greeks fight in. Uh, I, I was going to, I just want to tell you about, uh, uh, in Herodotus, he tells the tale about uh, uh, how, how the fighting went versus the, the Persians, and here's the line, he says, once the Greeks go to war, they choose the best and smoothest place to go down and have their battle on that. And that wasn't just because they sort of had an aesthetic pleasure in nice flat fields. That's what you need for a phalanx, because to maintain the uh, integrity of the hoplite line, you can't have bumps and grooves and trees and, and rivers in the way. It will break things up. So th they do, in fact, seek such a field. If you're, so if, if you're fighting a non-hoplite infantry crowd, you're in great shape. But what the Greeks spent most of their do, uh, time doing was fighting each other. One hoplite bat, uh, a phalanx against another hoplite phalanx. So you have to imagine that this thing started with these guys back in their camp and the other army back in its camp. And they both have to agree that they want to have a battle for a battle to take place. And they will have picked a place that is flat where they can do what they're doing. Usually, the battle took place over some uh, land that was uh, being contested uh, on a frontier, and they would go down to that area and pick a spot, and there they would go and fight with one another. So now, the, other, the two armies are lined up. Here's an interesting question. How wide is the line going to be? Well, that's not an answer that is entirely at the... Uh, disposal of the general, because he's got two considerations that he has to worry about. One is he can't afford to have his hoplite line outflanked, because if I can come around and take care of this guy from this side, he's engaged with the guy who's right opposite him, I can just kill him, no problem at all. <laughs> so he has got to at least try to be equal with the guy who's furthest on this side, and same with the guy on the other side. So that means he's got to open it, he's got to make his line, unless he comes up with some clever trick, the same size as the, guy, as the other guy. Well, what, typically the two armies aren't identically in, identical in size. So if you're going to try to be the same breadth across the field, that's going to affect how deep you can be. And depth, as we shall see once we get started fighting, is relevant in ways that we need to work out. But if one phalanx is eight deep and the other phalanx is 12 deep, the 12 deep phalanx has an advantage. And so numbers count, but it's, it's not an easy one-to-one -one question. Various issues will determine who comes out <coughs> ahead. Okay, now let's make this first battle I'm going to describe for you be as clear-cut as we can make it, and it probably never was like that. Let's imagine my army is the same size as theirs, precisely, so that the line is the same size on both sides. And, um, and so therefore also the same depth. And so we'll just do this Im imaginary perfect battle. He's going to have, at, as the two armies approach each other, I should make it clear, they start out walking at a certain clip. By the way, it's critical that they should stay in formation. Nobody should get ahead of anybody else. How do you do that? With rhythm. And the, uh, in subsequent armies and later in history, used drums to maintain that technique. The Greeks did it by the playing of a flute-like or oboe-like instrument that played a, a military tune that had you marching forward 
at the right pace. That was very, very important. So you're marching forward at that pace. But now as you get closer and closer to each other, various items begin to affect your behavior. One is, I would think, fear. In fact, I know. Fear. Uh, so what do you, you can't, supposing you feel like running. Can you boys in the first uh, row run anywhere? You got seven guys behind you. That's not even a, an option. And that's a very important aspect of the failing. That's not even an issue. So if you're afraid, what are you afraid of? Well, the other guy has got people, I should have mentioned, on the sidelines one way or another, shooting arrows at you, throwing uh, javelins at you, uh, things like that. Well, you want to get through that as fast as you can and engage with the enemy. But there's another reason why you want to get there fast is because, well, by now, You've gotten your, I should have pointed out that uh, chant, we, we know that before you started out the battle, the, your general gave you a, a meal, and he also gave you plenty of wine, so that by the time you're in this position, you've had a few. <laughs> and there's, I mean, there's a, there's a science to that, too, as perhaps some of you know. No, you don't. You're, college students say they have no science at all. They just sort of pour the stuff down their throats with the goal of becoming drunk as fast as they can. <laughs> That's barbaric in the technical sense. <laughs> I mean, the Greeks didn't think. Plato's Symposium, all of these guys are sitting around having a drinking party. That's all they do all night. But they also are talking. And they're talking very well, as a matter of fact. And they are the goal of this conversation is, or, or this party, rather, symposium means, by the way, drinking together. So they're drinking and they're talking. And both of these are supposed to go on at the same time. And here's the thing. The idea is to drink as much as you can without passing out. And at the end of Plato's symposium, everybody is out, <laughs> except for Socrates, who looks around and says, oh, well, no more conversation. Everybody's asleep. Off he goes, and we know who won that one. <laughs> Why could they do that? Well, they weren't, you know, ignorant undergraduates. But, <laughs> but beyond that, they drank wine, not those barbarian liquids that you drink, and also they mixed that wine with water so that it shouldn't get them drunk too fast. Think about how the world has decayed <laughs> since those days. <laughs> So anyway, but the point is they've been put, it still has its, uh, its uh, alcoholic consequences. And I like to think that the trick for these guys was to get to that level of inebriation before it affects your nerves and your physical ability to act. But it's worked on your brain to the point where you get to that, that sort of, what I like to think of that barroom, uh, militants, whereby if a guy says, would you pass the peanuts, you say, oh yeah? <laughs> I like to think that's the ideal hoplite <laughs> mode. So I think that's working on and They want to get at those SOBs on the other side. And they want to kill them. That's their move. Well, all of that is working on both sides. And so that when they come together, they come together in a trot. You have to imagine they're moving along quicker than you would by walking so that they will go bang and we can see what happens. However, there's one other variable that you want to be aware of. And that is, he knows he ought to be going straight ahead like that. But he also knows that his right flank is open. Well, he would love to be fighting at the edge of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> so he doesn't worry about his right flank. But he's out there in the middle of a field. Now, he knows that first step ought to be like this, right? But he's only human. So the first step is like this. <laughs> and so is the guy on the other end, on that side. So in fact, as Thucydides tells us beautifully in Book 5, when the two armies uh, actually hit each other, they have already made a slight turn to the right. Everybody moves to the right. These guys move to the right. Those guys move to the right. And they're, they're smacking each other at something like that angle. OK. So much for that. Now, here we go. I'm coming at this guy, and what I want to do, if I can, I want to kill him. 
<laughs> if I can't, I want to knock him back. Because what I really need to do is to get him out of the way. Let me imagine I've been lucky enough to get you out of the way. You're fighting him. You can't even look at me. <laughs> but I can do that. Well, that's not fair. <laughs> no, by no means. By no means. But let's face it, in order to kill you, I had to earn the privilege by knocking him back. <laughs> now, let's imagine I've been very lucky and got you. Just get down on your knee. Right. Uh, imagine she's very badly wounded or dead, but she's out of it. <laughs> now, here's where the ball game can really be determined. First of all, let's, let's consider the man behind you. Is that you? Yes. Right. Now, if you are standing there with your he, By the way, first three rows have a chance of hitting each other. If so he's banging away over somebody's head at the guy on the <laughs> other side. But... <coughs> You see this guy in front of you has just been knocked down. The blood is spurting out of her neck or her side or whatever. And, and she's groaning down there on the thing. What is your instinct? What? What's your instinct? Tell me. Get out of here. They just killed this guy in front of me and they're coming after me. I was thinking of that wonderful scene in... How many of you have ever saw the, uh, the Longest Day, about D-Day? There's a wonderful scene where this German officer comes down. He's in charge of the defensive uh, arrangements there at Normandy. He's in a bunker, and he's reporting back to headquarters, and it's dark, and, you know, and suddenly there's enough light, and he sees the, uh, suddenly on the, f on the horizon is 5,000 ships. The whole damn fleet, is, as he calls back, and he says, they're coming, they're coming. He says, why, why? He says, how many? He says, thousands of them. He says, in what direction? He says, auf mich zu, direct. <laughs> that's the way it looks to him. So what, that's what his tendency is. But if he does that, it's very bad news for his city. It, what he has been trained to do, what he knows he needs to do, is to fight forward and somehow over, step over her, step on her, do whatever he has to do to fill this hole. He's got to come forward and take the danger and take the blows and close the line. Because if not, now I am in the situation where my guy next to me, he's beating you up, but I can now get her. And I can step in here. And the guy behind me can do the same. And so we can create a wedge in which we are doing the killing, and they are doing the falling. And if enough of that happens, after a while, some sense of what's happening up front quickly works its way to the back. And there can be a moment, there, there always is a moment in a hoplite battle, where the guys in the back say, uh-oh, we have lost this battle. And so the guys in the back turn, and run, which is the only thing you can possibly do once you feel our phalanx is broken. We can't stand against them anymore. And when you start running, the only thing the guys who are left up front can do is run. Now, think of what it's like to run with this in your hand. Can you make much speed that way? No. And speed is what you want. <laughs> and so the big issue is this is what you must never do, but this is what you got to do if your phalanx is broken. You got to drop your shield and run. And then I'm on the winning side. What I want to do is kill as many of these guys as I can. However, you know, there's this great question of how far do the Greeks pursue in a hoplite battle? <clears throat> and Thucydides has an interesting passage in there in which he says something that it, the Spartans win the Battle of Mantinea and uh, Thucydides says, but they, the Spartans did not pursue hotly. The Spartans never pursue their enemies very far. It's as though he's explaining, giving an answer to a question that somebody asked, why didn't the Spartans do better in that battle, to which there could be many answers uh, at the Battle of Mantinea. But it seems there's a much easier answer. How, the, basically, the Greeks couldn't pursue very hotly with, with infantry. They don't want to throw their shields away. They want to keep their shields. So guys with shields are chasing guys without shields. 
they're not gonna chase him very far. Now, another issue that emerges in discussion of these kinds of battles is uh, casualties. For a long, long time, the general wisdom was there were not heavy casualties in hoplite battles. Uh, people calculating on what I was just talking about. But then uh, an old Yaley took this course when he was very young, uh, later became an ancient Greek historian, uh, took the wonderfully outlandish device of answering this question. He simply took all the battles in Greek history that we have a record of in which we know what the casualties were like and counted. And he concluded, you, anybody can check because there they are, that casualties could run as high as 15% at a hoplite battle. Those, that's a high casualty rate. And many a, a, a military unit will break if they have that many casualties. And the, actually, what he finds is the winning side would lose about 5%, and the, uh, the losing side would lose maybe as much as 15%. And so um, you get some idea, but don't imagine that these were anything like bloodless or easy. They were, they were bloody, uh, although the, the actual amount would vary with the circumstances. Now, um, you know the battle is over in a variety of ways. One, the enemy, one guy ran away. That's pretty good. But for the Greeks, it was very important that things should be really official. There were, uh, and there's a lot of debate about what I'm going to say next, there were protocols of fighting that were followed. Some people want to have these be many and for them to be very binding. Others want them to be very few and not very binding. And that's an, uh, an argument uh, one can get into. But some things seem to be uh, indisputable. For instance, if I say we won the battle, I can prove that to you most of the time. Why? Because I now occupy the land that we fought on. Therefore, I can do what they did. Take a stick, bang it into the ground, hang on that stick a captured helmet. By the way, please get it. Thank you. Um, a captured helmet or a captured corslet, something that represents the military equipment that the losers had that left on the field. We hang it up. That is called a trophy. And the word trophy comes from the word that means to turn, trefo. And it means to, uh, the reason that is, this is the place. You try to put it down at the place in the battlefield where the enemy turned and ran. And that, we own that property now. We own their equipment and therefore we won the battle. Another tangible way of understanding who won the battle and who didn't is we winners, because we own the field, we can pick up the casualties, take care of those who can be saved, bury the ones who have been killed. We don't have to ask anybody's permission. Burial is very critical. If you remember from reading the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey, um, it is absolutely critical in the Greek religion that people be properly buried. Because if they're not, their shade goes on forever in misery and pain. They cannot rest quietly in Hades unless their body has been properly buried. So you got to do it. The losing side must come to the winning side, and they must ask permission to pick up their dead and bury them. Typically, that is granted, and they can then do it. But, but they, they are, of course, humbling themselves by making the request and coming down under the orders of the winners and taking their dead away and being buried. So it's very, very clear who won and who lost. Bec and that's, I think it's a very important point because Greek hoplite warfare, which is the characteristic warfare of the Greeks from the 8th century on into the 4th, is um, never loses its character as a kind of a game in which there are winners and losers, and the winners are given the prize and the losers don't get the prize. It's a contest, just like everything else in Greek society. And there's a tremendous amount of pride that goes into victory and a tremendous amount of shame that goes into defeat. 
But we said the same thing about the Homeric heroes, didn't we? And here's the difference. They're not fighting for themselves. They're not fighting for their families. And only to a limited extent are they fighting for their personal glory, their kleos. They are fighting for their city. And they will be honored by their city in victory or even in, if they perform very heroically. And of course, what about if they were very shameful? What about if they run away? I think I want to save the illustration of that one until we talk about Sparta, where Tertius <coughs> tells us very, very specifically how bad that is. It's bad. And so you have this uh, tremendous continuity between the, the sort of the honor code that was so dominant in the Homeric world, which has now been shifted to the larger unit, which is the polis. And if you can see, all adult males fought. Who, I'm, I should back up. That's not quite true. To, I, I, there's an important point I didn't make. Not everybody gets to fight in the hoplite phalanx. The town, the city, the polis does not provide the fighters with their uh, defensive armor. They might, sometimes, they might give them their weapons, but not their defensive armor. You can't fight as a hoplite, in other words, unless you can afford to pay for your equipment. And that excludes a goodly number of citizens who are too poor to fight in the phalanx. This becomes a very, very large issue because the notion that there should be a real connection between citizenship in the full sense and military performance is totally a Greek, I mean, the Greeks just totally accept that idea. Actually, later on at the end of the fourth century when uh, um, Aristotle is writing his politics, he makes really a very clear connection as to the style of fighting and the kind of constitution that you have. He said very clearly, if you have, if you use cavalry as your major arm, your state will be an aristocracy. If you use hoplites, your state will be what he calls a politeia, a moderate regime. If you use a navy, your state will be a democracy in which the lower classes are dominant. So that there's this real connection, and that's the way they really thought about it. And so what we will see as the polis is invented, moving away from aristocratic rule in the pre-polis days or in the early polis days, you will see a middling group of citizens who are, according to this interpretation, Hansen's farmers who are also going to gain the political capacity to participate in the town councils, uh, and who are the hoplites. But it will exclude the poor who will not have political rights. And most Greek states, just as they never move beyond the hoplite style of fighting, never go beyond the uh, oligarchical style of constitution, which gives only hoplites political rights in the state. OK, bef now stay there, because who knows? We uh, the 20 million other things I might have said, but instead, let me put, uh, give you the opportunity to ask questions that you would like to raise, particularly if you want to ask about how they fought. As long as we have a phalanx here, we might as well use it if we need to. Are there any questions? Um, how were they practiced? Were they predominantly farmers? Yeah. The answer is they damn near didn't. That is, you, you've got a very key point. There was very little military training. On the other hand, you don't need very much. Think about it. What are the skills? What are the technicalities? If, the bat, if I'm, I'm the general, right? Uh, so I say, what do I say? Charge! <laughs> now we're in, engaging each other. What do I say? Fight harder, men! Now we're in trouble. And I say, don't run away! <laughs> there are no techniques. There are no maneuvers. There are no, you can't do anything. And so they didn't practice very much, except one st stunning exception, the Spartans. They were not farmers, as we shall see. And therefore, they spent their lives practicing warfare paid off. 
they usually won. So the answer is uh, basically that the, the ordinary Greeks did not engage in very much practice. Yes, ma'am. personas develop who are famed for being such wonderful individual soldiers if there's no real hand-to-hand one-on-one? Well, there, there is I mean, nobody out there that you right. could see. Typically, by the, we don't have guys like that. The guys who are famous are the generals who uh, get credit for putting together a nice formation when it's not the simple one I've just given you. I mean, just to be a little bit more uh, uh, plain about that, Famous Battle of Marathon. I will tell you about it when we get there. But one of its features is that because the Greeks were numerically badly inferior to the Persians, they had this problem of covering the line, you know? So instead, they could have thinned out their entire phalanx, but that would have given the Persians a chance to break through anywhere and everywhere. And so what, uh, th- um, who's my general? Miltiades. Uh, uh, did was to make his wings heavier, deeper, and very dangerously thin in the middle. It was a gamble. The gamble was our wings will crush their wings and turn in on them from behind and from the side and set them a running before they break through our middle. And as uh, Wellington said at, uh, at uh, Waterloo, It was a damn near thing. The Persians broke through the middle, but just before that, the Athenian wings crushed the Persian wings and set them running for their ships. So everybody says what a genius Miltiades was. Um, Similarly, in in naval battles, uh, Themistocles at um, uh, Salamis uh, comes up with a clever endless clever devices. So you see what I'm driving at. We know those guys. You never really hear of Joe Blow, who killed 34 guys in the phalanx. Uh, There must have been some guys like that, but you just don't hear about those fellows. Uh, Okay, any other questions? Yeah. When did they pull out their swords? When they had no spear. When, like, they speared them from the way they get broken? Yeah, these spears must have broke like mad. And so th- the thing to do, if, unless you have something else to do with, you know, you go for your, for your. It's not like you go out and you start fighting people. It's just you're behind your shield and you're happy. Always, oh yes, always. Y- and you never, I, according to my understanding of this, you never, never want to be without your shield. That means you never want to be away from your phalanx. This is disputed. This is exactly. These are the grounds on which this uh, new g- school. Uh, one of the ways in which they argue otherwise. I'll say a little bit about that when I get through with the phalanx. I just want to, yeah. What about projectiles? I mean, I can no, these guys don't have any projectiles. However, there are light-armed troops made up of those too poor to be in the phalanx who do use projectiles. And the projectiles are arrows, um, um, javelins, or stones thrown by... Um, Slings. The trouble with them is none of them has any range. Think about that for a moment. Oh, these are not, get out of your mind, Henry V. Forget the Battle of Agincourt. Don't have, what are those men in Lincoln Green with their enormous long bows, made out of good English composite, whatever, (laughs) who can fire the thing thousands of yards and penetrate and kill the, f- the, f- the French nobility. How many of you have seen uh, Henry V in the Laurence Olivier version, 1945? They've got this miserable modern one with these sort of Vietnam-like conditions that they have out there. It's raining all through the goddamn Battle of Agincourt. <laughs> Great battle. It's got to have sunshine, blue skies. Terrific. Well, never mind. Uh, they, had very poor, they had very poor bows and arrows. They didn't have the composite bow, didn't have much power, didn't, would have had a hard time getting through the shields, and it didn't have any distance. So, but they were worth something because they did this. Actually, those guys would be useful, not so much, hardly at all, during the scrum of the phalanxes. But should one side be retreating, that's where they do harm. 
there'd be, once you throw your shield away and you're running, any, anybody who's got a weapon can take you out. And that's when it would have happened. Yeah. So is it unlikely that someone like the, the fellow whose name is on your hand that you read about from the Mil selection? Miltiades? Uh, no, oh. uh, the archer in the Iliad. Oh, 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 in the Iliad. Well, is it unlikely that people would actually have been able to do anything like that? Yes, the, question, the Iliad shows has uh, various people who are very good archers who could kill the other guy. I would say it's, I'm sure there, was, there were bows and arrows at that time. But they did not yet have the kind of armor that they would have in this time. So they would have been more vulnerable, and you wouldn't have had to have such a powerful bow. Of course, Paris, uh, isn't he uh, the one who kills Achilles, right? Uh, but Achilles, of course, got him in the heel where he didn't have any armor. Anything else? Yeah. Ah, very good, yes, and, and that's a big argument that nobody has a good answer for. The traditional answer is that these guys actually did press up against the rows in front of them, and that this provided a momentum that gave the front line an advantage in beating the enemy facing them. You can see all kinds of troubles. Why didn't the guys in the middle get crushed? Uh, uh, you know, I don't have any very good answers for that, and yet, it is one part of the traditional explanation is this, and it's a very important one and much debated, that at a critical time in the battle, one technique would be one side would give one great big shove. The word in Greek is othismos. And if that was successful as it might be, it could knock down the lines of the front guys and get the other side running. And there's an ancient evidence, uh, there's an ancient source for that that says that's what happened. And that's one of the things that we have to deal with. The, the critics of this point of view would say that's impossible and inconceivable. Another possible explanation of the significance of depth <coughs> is remember our poor victim here. If you multiply her, then um, you want to have as much depth to fill in behind to close that hole as you can. So that that would make your phalanx more sturdy because you, ha you, could, you could take more casualties without breaking. That seems reasonable to me. Uh, but again, I, I can't imagine how these guys fought in these circumstances. I really can't see it. I mean, I, it's a pity we can't kill people as in experiments <laughs> deliberately <laughs> anymore because I mean, we need to see how this works. <laughs> but I uh, can't do it. Um, but I do think that that makes a reasonable amount of sense. Anything else on our, the mechanics of our phalanx? Yes. A little louder, please. How would you the Should charge each other? Is that what you're saying? Well, what happens is um, it's usually, well, it's always the case, one army is invading the land of the other. So it's, in a way, it decides when the fighting is going to take place up to a point. Namely, it's going to happen this summer, because we're coming. And it's going to happen this week. It's going to happen tomorrow if you don't run away. So now the defenders have to do, in the perfect situation, I am marching towards their corn crop, the grain crop, at the time just before the grain is going to be harvested. If we cut down that grain, you don't eat this winter. You get in front of the grain when we say. So that would be the classic way of determining how it works. It's never, it probably wasn't quite that easy. But that, no, the invading side goes for something that the other fellow has to defend. And that determines when the fighting takes place. Yes, sir. <laughs> Hard to say. <clears throat> Hard to imagine anybody doing this for more than a couple of hours. So that would be my guess, uh, but nobody knows for sure. But I think if you can imagine, up to a couple of hours would be about right. And that's worth mentioning. How long is a war? A couple of hours. Because typically, there's just one battle. One side beats the other, and that's the war for now. Until we get, of course, this is all early days, until we get to the Peloponnesian War, when things change radically in fighting in general. But this is your standard. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it could be that bad. Well, you got to realize that much of the time, until the, f until the phalanx breaks, there's not a lot of killing that can go on. You can only kill just, you know, just a few people while they're still defending themselves in this manner. I have to believe that the bulk, the bulk of the killing took place on the flight. And so that's why that works out. Yeah? What do you do the rest of the time? Just push? You, you, if you're not hitting, you're pushing. That's the theory. Uh, or two. <laughs> or two. Yes? How can they decide to break and crush if no one's there? No, that's right. They would have decided on the basis of what was most effective, and you would, you would not want old guys. By the way, how old are the people out there is a good question. Typically, the youngest guys are 20. Typically, the oldest guys are 45. But everybody was liable to military service in these states until they were about 60. So you can imagine in certain circumstances there would be guys that old back there. But fundamentally it's be between 20 and 45. Okay, I would have thought that the front row would exclude the older people. You want tough guys up front. You don't want your front line being broken. So the guys up front, are gonna, the younger you are, chances are you're going to be more physically strong than older guys. Probably, though, you wouldn't want to have the very youngest guys up front because another thing you want is experience. People who have seen this before, done it before, lived through it, and now you can count on them not to run away better than you can on a fresh recruit who's never done this before. So if, if you, I would have thought, so you see I'm speculating to a certain degree, but I would have thought you would have had guys 25 to 35 in the front couple of three lines, and then behind them, younger men, and then maybe the older men at the very back, or maybe because you wanted to be sure that that last row didn't turn and run away too fast, you might have some who were not quite so old at the very back. But it's all a question of what's effective and why. That would be my thinking about that. Yes. In what? Normally. I say that a typical phalanx is eight. However, by the time you get down to the fourth century and people are doing all kinds of new and innovative things, uh, we hear that the left wing of the Boeotian army at Leuctra was 50 men deep. Now, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> but it's, it's clearly a fact. There were previous examples of people trying to have a deep wing that would, uh, would do things. But if, if you take me back to my primitive phalanx here, about 600, 650, they're not doing that stuff yet. I would have guessed they were typically, but, but I, I think the depth would have been determined by how many soldiers you had available. You would have made your phalanx as deep as you could and as, once you had the width established. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. The question is, would, would the defeated army, would the winning army kill all the defeated guys who were still on the battlefield at the time? It, it would vary. They could capture them. There's, an adv there's a reason to capture them. You could demand ransom for them. So there would be some inclination to capture men rather than to kill them. On the other hand, guys who are engaged in a fight of the kind we must imagine get very angry. <coughs> and these guys killed a buddy next to you. So there would have been a certain amount of just furious killing going on. But I don't think that would have been the way you, you plan the game. You, you kill enough guys to achieve your goal, and if you're still rational, you take the, the rest prisoner, I think would be the way to go. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. What would stop it would be yeah, yeah, why didn't they flank each other? Boy, if they could, they would. But the difficulty is, if you take your left flank and move it out here so you can flank this guy, one of two things has to happen to your army. Either you open a nice hole between yourself and 
the rest of your army, in which case somebody's going to get very badly killed and you're going to be on the run very soon. Or you have to somehow communicate to the rest of the army, everybody come over this way, which will still leave that flank open to being flanked by the other side. That's what prevents that from happening. We just don't see that going on. Yeah? Is it just a great sense of honor and society that kept them from doing this more creative, like, sneak attack? I, I think it used to be thought that before people were very careful. We know that they do every terrible thing in the world in the Peloponnesian War. That whatever the rules were before, they're off when we get into the Peloponnesian War. There's just no dirty trick that anybody fails to do if he can. But uh, they surely must have done it before, too. Any, you know, when you're serious, any way to win will, will do. But mostly, you could make a virtue of a necessity. The kind of battle I've been describing to you, a nice flat field, two armies coming at each other, there's not much you can do in the way of trickery. And so you can take a high tone and say, anybody who fights any other way is a no good coward. In fact, we have some claim in a Roman writer later on that there was a, tr uh, a treaty back in the 8th century BC between a couple of states in Euboea that said they would never use uh, you know, what do you, uh, missiles of any kind, because that was cowardly. The only legitimate fighting is man against man, shield against shield, chest against chest. Everybody else is a pussy. <laughs> so I think uh, uh, that became, and, it be, and, and whatever the reality was, that story was always being told. That's the, the way for a man to fight. Anything other than that is open to suspicion. Well, okay. Thank you very much, Hoplites. A little hand for our Hoplites. <laughs> <coughs>Remember, the two sides are opposite each other in the field, probably in the morning. Each side <coughs> conducts sacrifices in which they ask the gods for assistance in the battle. Uh, sometimes they hope that there'll be a, a favorable omen suggesting they're going to win. They have breakfast, they drink, and they advance, typically, to a battle song called the Payan. Uh, which we have, uh, what, they sa what they sang. I don't have the tune, but I have the words. el leo el leo Does that sound like a good thing to march into battle? Sounds good to me. I like that. <clears throat> and then would come the battle. I talked to you about the uh, pursuit, the aftermath. <clears throat> Here's just one more thing you need to know about this phalanx mode of fighting. When the phalanx fought <clears throat> against any other infantry formation, the phalanx wins. Until, from the time we first hear of Greeks fighting non-Greeks, <coughs> when the Greeks have the phalanx, <coughs> I think I'm right in saying they never lose a battle. Finally they do in the, I think it's the second century BC, when King Philip of Macedon has uh, <coughs> his phalanx fighting against the Roman legion, and the legion wins. But believe me, it was no easy thing for the legion to win even in that battle. There's nothing automatic about that. <coughs> but <coughs> And so, so great was the military success of the phalanx that the king of Persia, who was always getting into wars uh, and hiring troops, Whenever the kings could, they hired Greek hoplites to fight for them. Uh, when King, uh, Prince Cyrus uh, seeks to overthrow his brother right after the Peloponnesian War, he signs up 10,000 veterans of the Peloponnesian War from the Peloponnesus because with 10,000 Greek hoplites, he believes that he can conquer the Persian Empire and make himself king, even though the numbers are fabulous. And those Greeks march 1,500 miles into the center of the Persian Empire, down into Babylonia, fight 
the army of the Persian king, defeat the army of the Persian king, but unfortunately, the prince who led them down there was killed in the battle, making the victory rather pointless because the whole idea was to make him king. And so then you have Xenophon writing his Anabasis, the march back, telling the story of how those 1,500, uh, uh, those 10,000 Greeks, rather, got back uh, home. Um, just a word uh, for the other side of the argument. I, I want to read you a quotation from uh, Hans von Weiss, who is the leading uh, critic of the traditional orthodox explanation I just gave you. <coughs> Here's one. It is clear that the emergence of the hoplite was only the beginning of a lengthy process, which certainly lasted more than a century and may have lasted more than two centuries, <coughs> leading to the creation of a close-ordered hoplites-only phalanx. <coughs> the classical hoplite formation then was not the long-lived military institution of scholarly tradition, <coughs> but merely one phase in a history of almost four centuries of slow change towards ever denser and more cohesive heavy infantry formations. And I'll read you one more <coughs> of his uh, statements. Those who favor an early date for the emergence of the hoplite phalanx rely on the arguments, um, an argument above all, one argument above all. The new type of shield adopted in the late eighth century, unlike its predecessors, could be used effectively only in an extremely close and rigid formation. Double grip shields thus presuppose or impose an extremely dense formation. The tacit assumption is that, ha is that hoplites stood frontally opposed to their enemies, like wrestlers, rather than sideways on, like fencers, holding their shields parallel to their bodies. But artistic representations show that this is not how hoplites fought. I would say, that the crux, the kernel of the critique, a lot of things you can argue about, the kernel of the critique lies in this assertion which derives its force from an interpretation of pictures on pottery. You can see I'm not too friendly to that interpretation, but it, it is being taken very, very seriously, so seriously, you fortunate Yaleys, <coughs> that there will be here on April 9th and 10th of 1908, an international conference on the subject of the hoplite phalanx and the emergence of the city-state. And it will be a classic Greek agonal confrontation <laughs> because among the other stars who are uh, going to be engaged, Curtis Easton will be one of them, uh, the main event will be a one-on-one -on -one between Victor Davis Hansen and Hans von Weiss. You're all very welcome to come on that occasion. See you next time.